Hey guys, I have here my Ames 10,000 watt split phase pure sine wave inverter. This is the inverter I just pulled out of service a couple of months ago. If you recall, in addition to some system upgrades, I was also having a few problems with it. And just a quick history for those of you who are not familiar with this channel or are just joining us, I purchased this inverter back in 2017. It was used, damaged, I don't know what you wanna call it. Uh, it came from the Amazon Warehouse Deals program. It did arrive with a couple of dents in it, so I don't know if it slid off a pallet or somebody returned it or what the deal was. But it's powered a large chunk of my home from that time up until a couple of months ago. And back in 2017, this was one of the best options on the market for a US split phase inverter at this capacity. This was before MPP Solar had their long lineup of products for the US market, and there really wasn't much else available that could do split phase and you know, 10,000, 12,000 watt uh, area. Now today there are many other options on the market, better from a size standpoint, an idle power consumption standpoint, efficiency, you know, just pure weight. Anytime I have to move this thing around, I have to bother the wife who happily helps me move it around, but you know, it is uh, quite a bit cumbersome to move. There are quite a few other things I just don't really care for about it that we'll get into throughout the video. But just to recap on the issue I was having with it, anytime I connect it or power it on a load, whether it be small or large, it could be anything from a light bulb to the clothes dryer or the fridge kicking in, there was a large fluctuation of voltage. Now, when I checked using my Fluke multimeter, I set it on the min voltage setting and it was reading down to about 70 to 75 volts anytime something kicked in. And that's just not acceptable. That's gonna damage electronics over a long period of time. It's causing my UPSs to constantly kick in that are on my computer and my server. You know, it, it's just not normal operation. Now, first instinct would be, hey, there's probably a loose connection somewhere, a wire nut, you know, a loose lug, something that needs to be tightened. Now, I've been over all the cabling at this point many times, both DC, AC, inside and outside of this unit, there are no loose connections. Now, a number of you, quite a few of you actually, in the update video, know that you think there may be a problem with the capacitors in this inverter. And that makes perfect sense and isn't really something I had thought about at first. So in this video, we're pretty much going to disassemble this inverter, take a look at a couple of things. I'm gonna point out some of the things I don't like or that have improved. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the capacitors and see if we can figure out what the problem may be. This inverter is pretty much scrapped to me at this point, unfortunately. I can't really sell it. I don't even wanna give it away knowing that there is a potential issue with it. In addition to the amount of times it's been taken apart, tinkered with, like I said, there are just a lot of better options on the market right now. Even from Ames themselves, they have a 12,000 watt version that is ETL listed. This 10,000 watt version is pretty old at this point. Uh, but anyway, let's get to it and see what we can find. Now, right away when I pulled the lid off this inverter, your eyes probably went straight to the massiveness of this transformer. And that's one thing this inverter's always been very, very good at is that it has a massive, massive inductive load starting capability. And there is actually a second transformer over here just to give it some extra inductive starting capability that I've since removed. Now, one of my complaints here is you'll notice there is some yellowing on this insulation. And that's because these conductors have been overdriven a bit and have been subject to excessive temperatures that actually caused a bit of melting, you know, not really melting, but uh, discoloration of the insulation. Now, why is that? So I'm gonna pull out this main circuit board here and show you a closer look. But before I do that, I wanna show you how this is actually wired before I disconnect these wires. So I've got most of the communications cables out of the way here. And you can see we're left with the connections from our transformer to our circuit board and their output over here on the left. The first thing you'll notice here is that we have our main line conductors here. Remember, this is gonna be 230 volts coming off this transformer. We then have our uh, neutral line here. The neutral completely bypasses the circuit board. It comes off of the transformer and goes directly to the output. Additionally, one other design problem, in my opinion, is we have the side mount GFCI outlet. This is actually a very nice feature because when you have an electrical installation like this, part of that part of code is that you need to have a service receptacle somewhere near your electrical panel. And this satisfies that requirement. You've got an inverter here that can push 10,000 watts. And we have a 20 amp receptacle here with no overcurrent protection. This is a GFCI, a ground fault outlet. However, the conductors from this go straight down to the output terminals. They are not going through any of these circuit breakers. There is no overcurrent protection on this receptacle whatsoever. Uh, so keeping in mind how this is connected here, I'm gonna take out the circuit board and show you a closer look. Taking a closer look at our control board here, we have three sets of terminals. We have the grid input, we have the output, and we have the inverter input. 
So these relays are going to be responsible for switching on and off the grid input uh, whether or not there is uh, inverter output coming in. Now, the input side is labeled input line and input neutral. The transformer side is labeled main TX line and we have main TX neutral. The output is labeled output line and output neutral. But if you remember, our actual neutral was not going through this board. We had line one and line two as part of the split phase US power configuration. The neutral was bypassing the board and going directly to the output terminals. Why is that a problem? It appears that this board or this inverter in general was originally designed for a 230 or 240 volt country. In my opinion, it was not originally designed to work with US power. So the result of that is we assume this terminal is the line and this terminal is the neutral. So this is our current sense transformer here. The power is coming in from the inverter. It's going through our current sense transformer and then it's going to the output terminal. That is our line. Since they consider this one to be the neutral, the transformer, which is really line two, is coming into this terminal and going straight to the output terminal. And that's evidenced here by the bottom. You can see how this is going straight across. It's straight connected. Now there is a bit of soldering residue here. That is my bad. It was not like that originally. Uh, that's simply because I had replaced this capacitor at one point. This circuit board is only sensing current on one of those two legs of the split phase configuration. And that is very, very dangerous. That means it's over current protection is not operating at all on that second leg. So you could pull, you know, 10 watts, you could pull 5,000 watts, you could pull 10,000 watts. And this inverter would not shut down because it's not aware at all of what is going on on this leg between this leg and the neutral. So that's a design flaw in how this inverter was built. And I think that is probably why we see some, some uh, melted plastic over here because we have overloaded these conductors at some point in the past. Again, I'm not an engineer or an inverter expert, but... All right, so let's take a look at what we got. At a quick glance, quick glance, I do not see any bloated or uh, blown up capacitors. I don't see any leaking electrolyte. Uh, I'm also looking for blown transistors. I don't see any blown transistors on either side. Um, however, there is one problem I noticed, and that is we've got two small ceramic capacitors here between these two banks of transistors. And you can see the circuit board is awfully burnt there. You know, something has happened there that's caused it to overheat. And not only that, if we take a look at the other side, the other side is the same way. In fact, it's quite a bit worse. So that must have got really hot for some reason there. The same thing on the top, you can see the board is actually burnt there. It's charred quite a bit. Uh, so does anybody know what the purpose of those resistors are? Specifically, the ones directly below the ceramic capacitors. All right, so again, with those heat sinks removed, there's nothing really obvious aside from the uh, burnt circuit board that I already noticed there. I still don't see anything visually wrong with these capacitors. Uh, they are quite large capacitors. I think I am gonna actually take them off and we'll see if we can test them. I think my multimeter has a capacitance testing uh, option there. One other thing I wanted to do is just see if I can peel off some of this insulation here to see what this looks like below the insulation. Wow, so I didn't expect that at all. Look at the number of conductors under here. I thought this was one cable. It's a whole pile of smaller conductors. Is that soldered? It is soldered. It's crimped and it's soldered. That is probably why it got hot. That is not a very good way to attach a high current conductor. Why in the world would you crimp a high current conductor like this? Crimp it and then squeeze some solder into it. That is beyond me. That looks terrible. It's all crusty down in here. So I know there's a lot of debate on the internet as to whether you're supposed to crimp, solder, or crimp and solder. But the fact of the matter is, if you have a proper fastener, a butt splice in this case, a proper crimp tool, and you're crimping it with the proper amount of force, you should not need solder. There should not be any air gaps in here. All this air gap, even with the solder, you know, there's even a giant ball of solder hanging off the bottom here. This is probably the point where this was overheating. I have noted in the past when I did some load tests of this, trying to see how far I could push it, that it was emitting an odd smell, even though it would not shut down. And I'm going to guess that was from this insulation overheating. This one doesn't look as bad as this one does. You can tell this one's pretty, pretty uh, discolored and what I would call burnt here. So, and here's how the other end is terminated. There is quite a bit of solder going up the conductor, which does suggest that the enamel coating was scraped off. And there's probably some flux used here. 
But again, even with the crimp and the solder, there's still a large gap in there going around this conductor where it was crimped on. Um, you can see they really pile it on the end here. They kind of sealed off the end with solder, but. So these capacitors are all the same here. That is part number CD294. It's a 100 volt, 6,800 microfarad capacitor. We've got 6,400 microfarads. 6,400 microfarads, 6,400 microfarads, 6,400. Well, that one looks a bit odd. What is that, 660? You know, guys, I just, I don't know. I don't know, this inverter's old. There's a number of things either wrong or that I don't like about it, so. So hopefully that was of some interest. Hit that like button before you go. Questions or comments, you can leave those as always. And onward to bigger and better things. Thanks for watching.